Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy B. Wilson. So we have an interview for today's show. Uh, John Perlin, author of the book A Forest Journey, The Role of Trees in the Fate of Civilization, joined me for a chat. And when I found out about this book, this whole thing fascinated me. Like the second I got information about it, I was like, yes, I would like to talk to the person who traces the close link between the successes and failures of human civilization with the way they use and live with the forest. Yeah, that, I am also fascinated. Um, <laughs> this conversation covers the history of the book, which is its own story, as well as science and history going all the way back to Gilgamesh. I love Gilgamesh, so I am excited to hear this uh, because Holly conducted this interview, so we're going to jump right into it. John, I am so delighted and honestly excited to talk about you in this book and trees. But I want to talk first about your background because uh, it's physics. Oh, uh, no, it's actually um, the first um, iteration of a forest journey hit the eye of a uh, physics professor. And uh, two years later, he won the Nobel Prize. And uh, he loved a forest journey so much, he asked me to join the physics department. That's fascinating. So you started out more in environmentalism and history, ended up in physics, and now you are talking more about the thing that originally got you into that field. What actually got me into the field was um, I did the uh, first breakthrough book. It was a history of solar energy called The Golden Thread, 2,500 Years of Solar Architecture and Technology, which recently has uh, morphed into a book called Let It Shine, The 6,000-Year Story of Solar Energy. And while I was working on the uh, solar history book, I discovered that Every time people uh, built their houses uh, to catch uh, the sun for heat was because they were running out of wood uh, to heat their houses. So I, um, after I finished the uh, Golden Thread book, I asked the question, if uh, wood was such an important fuel, it was like the oil of almost every society until like, or or it was like the coal or the oil um, up till about the um, beginning of the 19th century. I asked myself, oh, well, the uh, trees must have played a pretty big role in the development of uh, societies. And so that's how I plunged in without, you know, just making that assumption. And little did I know it would take me on a a 40-year, like, uh, trip, uh, (laughs) which which, uh, resulted in the new Patagonia book. Yeah, this uh, the life cycle of this book is really fascinating to me and quite unique, I think, in the world of books. The first edition, as you said, came out in 1989. Now you have the third edition, which is significantly updated. But will you talk about that lengthy road and how Patagonia ended up publishing this new version of it? My whole life is based on serendipity. Anything I've ever planned never works out as uh, expected. So what happened was I was... Uh, leading the symposium at the University of California, Santa Barbara, on uh, Eunice Foote, the woman who in 1856 uh, discovered that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. And uh, she's really the um, mother of climate change science. And so I was doing the first symposium ever done at the university, and that was in 2018. And the local uh, newspaper called the Santa Barbara Independent had a story on uh, the symposium and the Schnards who own uh, Patagonia saw that I was in Santa Barbara, only 25 miles away from their headquarters. And so suddenly they wrote to the editor of this uh, Santa Barbara Independent and said, we've been trying to find John for like a decade because this is our favorite book and um, we would like to connect with them. And so about, uh, I would say about a month or two later, I was uh, signing a contract with uh, Patagonia to do this uh, a new book. And the fortunate uh, part of it was um, a lot had happened both in historical research and also in uh, modern research on the uh, importance of trees. Uh, obviously, you've been researching this now for decades. And even when we do our show, I mean, we've been doing it for 10 years and the things that have become available to us 
over that decade have shifted consistently and expanded a lot as we've gone just because of new technologies, more things being digitized. How much has your research changed and expanded as a consequence of going on through, you know, several decades worth of work? Well, for example, in 1989, there was no uh, internet. So the searching was a lot more uh, in-depth. And also, being part of the university, uh, they have an online library of all the important journals, even the very esoteric, arcane journals, which uh, ended up helping me very much. But also, the science of forestry had really changed over the years that my book came out. Uh, Back in 1990 was the first study that was uh, published in uh, Science Magazine that old growth was really greater, oh, you might say, collector or absorber of carbon dioxide than, say, a um, young tree or a a tree that was allowed to be uh, harvested as a crop over 60 or 70 years. So that's one example of how forestry has changed. And in the last decade, all sorts of uh, discoveries, for example, that trees create rainfall and they are responsible for at least 40% of the world's precipitation. For example, the Amazon creates a a river in the sky that satiates the thirst of people living all the way uh, south in Buenos Aires, for example. And trees in the Congo, for example, uh, provide 40% of the water for the Nile. And so all these uh, plethora of new studies What it did was allowed me to show that in times past, the forests were necessary for the development of civilization. And today, forests are even more important for our existential uh, survival. Can you give us a quick science lesson and explain how forests are responsible for precipitation? Oh, exactly. Well, what forests do is uh, they take in a lot of uh, water because it's the water in the leaves that interacts with the sun to photosynthesize where the tree gets all its nourishment, but it only may be uh, 10 or even less percent of the uh, water that goes up to the leaf is used for this reaction. So that the rest of the water is, uh, you might say, exhaled into the atmosphere and that uh, water uh, becomes uh, clouds and the clouds as they go over uh, areas Uh, becomes rain. Amazing. The way you trace this history is tied really to not just the development of like civilization and how we've used trees, but you really trace the way that trees have developed, uh, starting right out of the gate with what you call the earliest modern tree. It's not what I call it. It's what every uh, scientist calls it. Gotcha. Will you tell our listeners about that and why it is important to note that moment historically where the, the first modern tree starts to exist? The first true tree, the reason why it's called the first true tree is because it has deep roots, uh, for one thing. Ah. Oh. And deep roots uh, is where most of the sequestering of uh, carbon occurs in in the roots. What they do is they change rainwater, which is basically diluted carbonic acid, which means uh, liquid carbon, into what's called carbonates, which basically we call uh, limestone. And so when the carbon um, in the carbonic acid interacts with the roots, the roots change the rainwater into carbonic acid and then finally ends up in the sea uh, where it ends up as limestone. And that's where the carbon dioxide is uh, locked in, right, in rock, so it can't escape. So what, what this true tree did was it was the first plant that started to really take down the carbon dioxide, which was in excess for any kind of large life on the uh, terrestrial planet. And also, the leaves, as they photosynthesize, they give off oxygen. So it created an oxygenated atmosphere where um, creatures like you and me can metabolize and survive. And so the first four-legged creatures 
were attracted from the ocean. Uh, the, the first four-legged creatures that could had lungs like a lungfish could escape uh, where you had in the oceans at the time huge, voracious, carnivorous fish. And so you, you could end up on land where it was a lot safer because you had, you know, oxygen, uh, the capability of breathing. Right. A lungfish can survive uh, out of water uh, for multiple years, and they also have legs that can walk. And so they believe the first uh, creatures that basically are the root of every, like, reptile, mammal, and bird began. He is with this tree. You find the first uh, four-legged creatures. They're called tetrapods. And as you know, we have two hands, right, and two legs. So we're four, basically um, a four-limbed uh, creature, right? And birds are the same way. You know, they have wings, two, and they also have two feet. And it goes, you know, to amphibians, you know, it goes into reptiles, uh, up up the whole tree of what's called uh, animals, right? And so it also provided a habitat for these uh, new pioneers into the land because the tree coverage created uh, basically food in a uh, form of a leaf and also made a um, sort of a heaven uh, for little insects, things like that. And so the... It, the tree is called Archaeopteris, and in 1990, in Nature magazine, which is the premier uh, scientific magazine in the world, announced the discovery of the first true tree, Archaeopteris, because it had both roots. It had a, a trunk, and this is really interesting. It had a trunk very similar to a pine mm -hmm. and it had branches with uh, leaves on them. And now what makes it even more fascinating it's one of what we call a transitional fossils uh, that proves uh, the veracity of Darwinism because the leaves were from an older type of uh, plant called fern, but the uh, trunk was uh, exactly like a gymnosperm. And so because on Earth at the time on the planet, there was one single continent called Gowandaland, a huge continent, the tree was able to proliferate throughout the uh, terrestrial world, the land world. And today we find fossils of this tree in Oklahoma, in Pennsylvania, in uh, upstate New York, in uh, Ireland, in Morocco, and uh, in South Africa, and also all the way up uh, Spitsbergen, the, the big island off of uh, Norway in the Arctic Circle. They're everywhere, is what you're they telling were every, me. The fossils were everywhere because... There was one big continent at the time, and so it had the capability of spreading uh, its uh, what were called heterospores, you know, their their um, seeds. But they were they were they were a primitive form of seed throughout the world. Amazing. And so what this did was with uh, for all all these, and also because it had deep roots, it was no longer um, dependent on being close to water, so it could you know be in various uh, landscapes. And so what the tree did was it initiated the takedown of uh, carbon dioxide, but also added so much oxygen that we have evidence of the first forest fires because there was sufficient oxygen uh, for um, ignition. Oh, wow. In fact, I have a fossil collection because I actually uh, like to go to the places where I write about and experience them physically. And uh, like I say, this is all in the new book. It wasn't in the old uh, edition. I went and uh, spent two weeks uh, digging Archaeopteris fossils in Pennsylvania. And I have, for example, a charcoal that if you run your finger through it, it smears on your finger, even though it's 300 and uh, say 70 million years. As if uh, I got the uh, charcoal from yesterday's uh, campfire. Oh, my goodness. That's amazing. So this this was the, um, uh, you might say, introduced, we, we use this term in science, introduced the tree idea that uh, proliferated over the hundreds of millions of years. Amazing. I, 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 what it did was it made the climate possible for um, creatures to proliferate over the um, millions of years. So if not for Archaeopteris, we wouldn't be doing this interview. So 
that is obviously like a very key moment in terms of the history of trees on our planet developmentally for all species. But I also want to ask you what you see is the most important moment that trees were part of from a technological standpoint uh, for humanity. Well, actually, uh, the misnamed Stone Age was actually the Wood Age. Ah. And if not for um, wood fires, for example, um, none of our species could have uh, traveled out of Africa because um, it, get, it gets cold, you know, when you go up north. And if not for wood fires, we would have, you know, no hope homo sapien ancestors in uh, the majority of the world. So, but, and secondly, the um, wood enable of the first uh, homo sapiens and also the Neanderthals to actually more successfully use their stone tools because if you're ever trying to break a rock holding a stone without a handle, you don't get very far, right? Right. <laughs> so what, 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 and these are recent discoveries is that um, Neanderthals and early homo sapiens used um, wood handles uh, for all their implements, which also provided survival for us to live today. And so, to, I hope I'm answering your question. And so then, as we get to, quote, civilizations, uh, this is where we see most of the uh, deforestation. Actually, um, forests covered almost 60% of the habitable uh, land on Earth 10,000 years ago. We've cut down at least uh, 30%, and um, 80% of that 30% happened as uh, civilization arose 5,000 years ago. And so that's actually, the book is the story, too, of how civilizations depended upon wood, but also that dependency on the wood required um, massive deforestation. And the first story of deforestation is in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Yeah, there. I really, really enjoyed that section because it, it makes very clear that the very thing that any person of power was doing, like trying to build so aggressively to expand their culture, destroyed the very resources that they needed to sustain that culture. And that happened over and over. There are many instances of that throughout the book. Are there any historical examples of civilizations or cultures where that is not the case, where they realized that there was that that delicate balance that needed to be respected? There was a counter argument uh, made at that time at the Epoch of Gilgamesh. Um, as you might have read at the end of the book, one of the uh, partner of Gilgamesh who cut down the forests and um, the partner who participated as they were coming down on wooden rafts, uh, he looks at Gilgamesh and he says, I think we've turned the uh, cedar forest into a wasteland. And then he says, what will our gods think of us? So here you have the first environmental realization that uh, perhaps we have done great harm. That's amazing. So this is uh, 5,400 years ago. And as an example of the uh, the um, new material, the uh, ultimate uh, translation of Gilgamesh appeared in 2001, which greatly um, aided the uh, chapter on Gilgamesh. And remember, Gilgamesh came from Uruk, and Uruk was the first outpost of civilization in the world. And so it's a story that uh, actually uh, provides the platform for uh, a forced journey because it's Gilgamesh's forest journey that then I tell year after year after Gilgamesh. So Gilgamesh, um, see, he was really uh, bummed out because he uh, was uh, two-thirds God and one-third human, so he was like mortal. And so he wanted to make a name for himself, and suddenly he came upon the only way was to cut down the cedar forest to build civilization. And so this is the whole, you might say, bouquet of the book. So just like Archaeopteris shows the value of uh, the tree, the Gilgamesh episode uh, shows where we're going to go as the sort of the prelude to the rest of the book. 
Right. And just to add is that um, the gods lived in the forest because at that time, according to the writer, the forests were the heaven on earth. Mm. So why did they have to go? You know, it was only when Gilgamesh cut down the abode of the gods that they had to uh, seek a uh, life far away as possible from human beings way up in the sky. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Um, how that shifts our, our storytelling as well as our civilization. Well, also what's interesting about uh, the Gilgamesh story is that the guardian of the forest, and this is all from the new translation, he was placed by the gods to keep humans out. He had, according to the translator, a tusk. And the implication is that um, elephants once uh, roamed, you know, the Middle East in, in the lush forests. And in the, once again, in the last few years, and, uh, and this is uh, part of the new book, uh, they've discovered uh, in northern Syria a plethora of ancient uh, elephant bones. And uh, actually also in new translations of the, you might say, the platforms of the various uh, Mesopotamian kings. Uh, they all brag about killing elephants in the Middle East. And can you imagine, I mean, think of it. Do you think of the hills in uh, Iran, for example, to be the equivalent of, say, uh, the Pacific Northwest? No. And uh, where have all the elephants gone, right? Right. Because what happened, and that's another important part of the book, is that the forest is the habitat for almost all living uh, creatures. It makes you think about what could have been had people been more thoughtful about that. Correct. And and what's and, and also you asked, well, um, were there conservation-minded people? Well, in Genesis, for example, in the uh, Hebrew Bible, uh, the first um, demand of God to uh, Adam is and and I speak Hebrew, so um, it's uh, lishmor ha'etzim, which means uh, protect, but protect in a very militant way. The trees. Mm. So it's right there from the beginning. The message has existed. Well, also, uh, what's really interesting I've been going through uh, is that uh, in Ezekiel, for example, the um, death of a tyrant is described as the um, as falling like a huge cedar. And once again, in the Bible, there's the um, oh, environmentalism where, for example, in Isaiah, Isaiah takes the life of an oak and he like rubs his brow in uh, safety because he says that the great um, king, Sargon the Great, uh, has died. And so now I, the oak, can uh, flourish. And with the Messiah coming in Isaiah is like the desert it gets transformed as a woodland, and Israel, uh, once again, has plenty of water. And that's uh, what we earlier discussed, is the relationship between trees and precipitation. So that was recognized like maybe, what, three or 4,000 years ago, that relationship. So we knew that from the stories in um, the Hebrew Bible, and yet um, no one learned. You also included a story in the book about Cicero raising concern that Rome was destroying its forest lands. Um, and there have been, like you said, all of these other warnings that have come along throughout history. How have those warnings of the need for conservation been perceived throughout history? You know, today, it's a battleground for a lot of people. Uh, but I'm wondering how it was perceived in previous civilizations. Well, it's interesting. I, I, I appreciate you bringing up Cicero because what Cicero was complaining about, he was complaining about the vineyards taking over the forests. And that's happened and happening in uh, California, where both in the north, uh, the redwoods are giving way to the vineyards. And in where I live, the uh, oaks have been um, oh, decimated uh, for vineyards. And so Cicero thousands of years ago, was uh, on a rampage, you might say. He, Like he says, he says it's much better to have oaks than to have wine. And yet, oh, uh, so many people I know, see, nobody puts things together, and that's what I hope my book does, 
is nobody puts together the fact that they're drinking wine and that caused the uh, destruction of the trees. And so maybe we can change our activity a bit to have uh, the trees flourish. But until we learn these uh, various uh, dependencies, you might say, where, where or, or threats, like, um, so people, you know, har, 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 I want to drink my wine, right? But nobody puts it together that uh, by um, purchasing wine, you're actually supporting the decimation of uh, the woodlands. Yeah, there's so many um, instances of cause and effect that I don't think most of us even think about that are super important. I want to talk about some of the additional really fascinating stories that you tell in this book, because there was one that I read that was completely captivating. You talked about in Greek Asia Minor, after the Homeric Age, there's a section in the book about it, about farmers suing a river, which made me like do a triple take and reread the paragraph over and over. Can you tell us that story? Oh, I'd love to. Uh, so what happened was uh, by deforesting the riverbanks, the um, saltation created a very like, you know, windy uh, river uh, and also uh, like destroyed uh, the ports uh, that it fed into because once the uh, protection of the soil by the uh, roots is removed, then just all the uh, earth comes down and silts up at the uh, where it comes all out in the ocean, which we call the delta. And so the uh, ports no longer were ports because of the creation of deltas. And so what the um, farmers did because they lost land because of, uh, you know, erosion, uh, they would charge a ferry uh, boat ride to compensate for that loss of ag land. Huh. Is, and I think that answers your question, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, they, yeah. They, they, so they compensated by suing the river and forcing the people who needed to go across to uh, pay for the damage uh, the river had done and deforestation had created. There are a lot of examples in your book, obviously, of just casual overusage of wood resources uh, that I had never thought about. The one that jumped out to me was just something that we think about often in very romantic terms is the baths of Rome. But heating those baths ate up a lot of wood. Will you talk about some other instances of resource overuse in history that we might not automatically think about? Well, I'd like to talk about the Baths of Rome because that's one of the ways I got into uh, writing about a forest journey because the Baths of Rome, because of the um, fuel shortages they created, because to keep the Romans lo loved their baths to be, you know, steaming hot, like, like, not like, like, like 60 degrees, not 70 degrees, not 80 degrees, you know, about 100, right? Whew. And they actually had sweat rooms, too, to heat. Right. And so uh, all these uh, trunks, they, they, they burnt trunk after trunk of uh, wood. And this is one of the entrees uh, as I began my research from my solar experiences, because the Romans were the first people to discover that glass uh, traps solar heat. And so what they did is they designed their baths so they all face the winter sun. So during the colder part of the year in uh, Rome, um, the sun's beams would come into the bath and be captured because the wavelengths uh, were are different are different when the sun goes in and when it's turned into heat. And so this was a solar um, plan that all the leading uh, Roman architects actually um, uh, uh, wrote about that we still have access to. And so the question is, where did the uh, trees come from? And this will blow you out too. Uh, a good portion of the trees came from North Africa, which was considered the great woodland of uh, the Roman Empire. And as a parallel to um, oil, you know, being transported by um, oil tankers, uh, the Romans had 500 uh, boats, ships, that were in constant travel between the forests of North Africa and the baths of Rome. Because if the Romans didn't have hot baths, there would be an immediate rebellion. 
and to keep the population happy. It's sort of like California, where if you don't have your hot tub, uh, you know, your natural <laughs> gas for your hot tub, you know, you'll uh, you, you'll you'll start to uh, you know get really pissed, right? <laughs> um, do you have a nominee for most careless civilization when it came to forests? Is it us? Well. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar. Uh, are you familiar with the walrus and the carpenter in Alice in Wonderland? Yes. Okay. Well, with the walrus and the carpenter, there was an uh, um, and you're and you're familiar with Tweedledee and Tweedledum, right? Of course. Okay. Well, um, Tweedledee asks Alice after you know that they told her the walrus and the carpenter poem, right? Uh, who did she think was worse, uh, the walrus or the carpenter? And so Alice jumped in and said, "I think the walrus." Because he ate um, oh, uh, more uh, oysters. Uh-huh. But then Tweedledum jumped on her and said, but the carpenter tried to eat as many as he could. <laughs> and so I think the same thing is with uh, civilizations is uh, depending on the uh, ability to access timber, you had um, more consumption. And so the difference was in olden times, it was economically not feasible to um, collect wood uh, more than 15 miles from a river. Right. But um, when we developed, uh, for example, the railroad, uh, you could go in and just, uh, you know, uh, just wherever you built the track, you can you could, like, go um, take it out. In fact, uh, I don't know if you noticed in the book, uh, there's an incredible picture of a, a railroad uh, train uh, with the, all the flat cars carrying these huge logs. Did you see that? Yeah. You know, I mean, they were just huge. I mean, uh, I don't think we could, in California, we could dream of trees being that large. In fact, there are several, I think, very uh, striking pictures of, um, you know, the girth of those trees and also the um to show how little respect people had is there's one image and this is all new and it never was shown before in um, the other editions uh is a dance floor created from the stump of a um giant sequoia yeah where where, where 40 people are dancing astonishing yeah, so it's 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 the old like uh, Tweedledee Tweedledum, uh, you know, uh, a, now, a story of the walrus and the carpenter is I think all societies, and uh, that includes uh, you know we people some people uh, worship you know the noble savage or the indigenous as they call it, uh, but they were um, as destructive, but they only had the capability, for example, in North America because they didn't they didn't even have like oh. Uh, draft animals, right? So you realize that oh, uh, they were constricted in um, damaging the forest uh, by A, their uh, sparse population size, and also they did not have metal tools. I don't know if you know that. Right. The reason for that is because they came over from Asia before metallurgy developed. Oh, that makes sense. And so they didn't have in their your toolkit, right? They had handles, right? They had handles for stone tools, which I uh, elaborated came from the Stone Age, but from the Metal Age, which I also show is not the correct uh, oh, name. It's the Charcoal Age, because without charcoal, uh, there was no way you could remove uh, the um, metal uh, from the uh, rock. Right. Because we only have like 5% of the world, we have a metal that's called native metal that, you know, is pure. And the other 95% comes as ore. And so that had to be extracted by heat. And so the metal age is another misnomer because it was actually the charcoal age because without charcoal, um, which provides a hot and uh, steady fuel, we could have never extracted of uh, that, that metal uh, from the stone. The book is so beautiful. Congratulations on this update. It's gorgeous. But I, as my parting question, I would love to ask you what 
uh, you feel like is the most important lesson we can take from learning about the history of trees as we move into the future? Stay out of the forest. (laughs) So many people will be chagrined at the thought of that advice, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, um, we can't drink a petroleum, right? Right. And um, we it's scientifically proved that um, not only do the trees provide uh, water locally, but also they act like relays. So like I said earlier, they take water and take it, say, a thousand miles away. For example, the forests in Siberia provide China um, with uh, rain. So if we remove all the forests, no water. Right. And water is, uh, I think, much more important uh, than, um, you know, any other resource, because without water, we uh, could only subsist for three days. Right. And so um, basically, I hope people see uh, the folly that other civilizations like uh, uh, went through to say, hey, uh, you know, a big slam in the face and say, wake up, wake up, you know, um, let's not repeat. And I also hope they see that the forests are so valuable. For example, uh, there's a portion that talks about human help in forests. Yes. Where the um, major illnesses that people in um, the world have suffered were created by removing the trees, which served as a barrier, or you might say a... Um, Oh, uh, social distancing. And once we open the forest, we open uh, humanity to these terrible diseases like Lyme disease, uh, like oh, uh, Ebola, like oh, uh, malaria. And actually, in 2018, I got a hold of a article in the leading uh, journal on frontiers in microbiology, which was titled Bats, Deforestation, and coronaviruses. Oh, wow. And all the coronaviruses, there, there's uh, two or three various coronaviruses, and the proven origins of uh, these other coronaviruses have always been uh, the opening of the forest. And so, um, you, know, it, you know, right now in Congress, because they want to find an enemy, uh, no one's looking at uh, the possible uh, relationship of deforestation and the uh, COVID uh, decimation of uh, the world. Well, hopefully they will all read and learn. If that's what, yeah, I mean, that's... That's the hope. So you you asked, uh, why uh, did I do the book? Well, I thought I had a whole novel uh, look at uh, the world, which I think you agree upon. Yeah. And so hopefully this will wake up people to say, you know, we've got to uh, stay out of the forest and actually, uh, perhaps we value uh, people not doing uh, work at all uh, and getting paid for it because they would uh, otherwise uh, need to uh, cut down the wood, you know, for lumber, for uh, vineyards, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So if we could uh, develop a different um, philosophy uh, where um, basically uh, having our hands like, oh, um, just... Uh, maybe dancing or something like that, uh, you know, instead of the chainsaw. Uh, that sounds like a lot more fun to me. Yeah, and, and to understand, um, for example, uh, uh, the best example of what happens when you cut down the forest in uh, China, for example, under Mao Zedong, the um, dust storms that created the pollution in Beijing was all a consequence of urging the peasants to uh, cut down the trees for fuel to make um, oh, um, I- iron. You know, it was the Great Leap Forward. And the Great Leap Forward was actually a great, like, oh, um, oh a somersault backwards. Right. We did, we did a multi-part coverage of the Great Leap Forward, so our listeners will be very familiar with that. Yeah. Oh, so much food for thought. I... I thank you so much, John, for spending this time with me. I feel so lucky to get to learn from you. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me.
Many, many thanks to John for spending this time with me and talking about just a handful of the historical events that he covers in the book. This whole thing definitely made me think about how closely entwined the success and health of our forests are with the success and health of the people here on Earth, and that happening often in ways that we don't consider. So I'm grateful to have this opportunity. John has also written several books on solar history, including A Golden Thread, 2,500 Years of Solar Architecture and Technology, and Let It Shine, The 6,000-Year Story of Solar Energy. This new and heavily expanded edition of A Forest Journey is available now wherever books are sold. Uh, For listener mail, I have an email from our listener, Rachel, who wrote a really interesting email about um, the Alma Petty Gatlin trial. And she writes, Good afternoon, Holly and Tracy, slash Tracy and Holly. I just finished your latest podcast on Alma Petty Gatlin and the violations of her most vocal accuser as a man of the cloth. This triggered a memory from while I was an attorney serving in the Army, an Army judge advocate. I was stationed at a base in Virginia working as a command advisor and litigator, and while it was not my usual assignment, a colleague in my office was going on vacation and asked me to cover a legal brief for the semi-annual regional chaplain week-long training block. I know you know, but just as a note, chaplains are the military version of counselors, and while they have an ordained religion and may host religious services, they are generally available regardless of faith as therapeutic and spiritual help to many military families and individuals. The day of the presentation, I followed the PowerPoint slides brief, defining privilege and walking through military, state, and federal regulations. Then we got to what religious-type privilege did not cover. I gave the example that a chaplain who was a witness to a car accident would not be bound by privilege to testify to what they heard and visually observed as a bystander slash witness. I was not ready for the spectacle that ensued. Nearly every chaplain had some vocal objection or what if. Some stated that by being a first responder to the accident, they'd rush over to pray with the people involved in the car accident, thus invoking privilege. Others said that because God put them at that scene, it was a call from a higher power to have them intervene and help, therefore preventing them from serving as witness in a court of law. As I was trying to allay these initial concerns, the Catholic priests chimed in and say they wouldn't speak ever, period. And this spiraled into a cacophony of chaplains declaring over one another their willingness to go to hypothetical jail before ever potentially violating any privilege, regardless of what any secular judge would order against them. Despite my efforts, the presentation devolved into a religious kind of green eggs and ham uh, discourse in a car, in a bar. We went more than 30 minutes over my scheduled time, at lunch no less, and no one in the audience seemed to mind. Given the passion that I experienced that day, it was bizarre indeed to hear about a man so flippantly betraying that privilege. His religious leaders of his time must have been rocked at his violation and its subsequent publicity. Anyway, I hope you get a kick out of this story. I love your podcast. I've been listening since fall of 2013 when I started law school and needed something to listen to that was lighthearted but still informative. I love how the podcast has developed since then. It is funny to have a topic intersect a strange experience from the career I started on with Stuff You Missed in History class a decade ago. And then included is my tithe to the Stuff You Missed in History class hosts attached to the email. I don't have pets of my own right now, so I'm sending the one I rescued with my stepdad for my mom after our Alaskan Malamute Lucy, like the mischievous redhead, passed away. Meet Casper, the friendly ghost, for his white face and calm attitude. He's a husky we rescued from the shelter in 2015. He is always perfectly quaffed looks resigned when I take too many pics, and obsessed with his snowman squeaky toy. Mr. Snowman came in a package with tennis balls my mom bought me for Christmas, not realizing it was a dog toy. Casper is iffy on tennis balls, but it was love at first sight with Mr. Snowman. Mr. Snowman has since endured multiple surgeries, with Casper worriedly tending his bedside when my mom restitches him, now with sock grafts, and stands watch outside the washing machine at Mr. Snowman's bath time. He is too cute. Thanks and mercy. I have such a soft spot for uh, Huskies and Malamutes anyway, so Mm -hmm. this is all extra, extra fabulous. But this whole thing is really, really interesting to me, discussing, you know, current takes on confessional privilege and when um, men of clergy, which it sounds like would never, ever betray it. Um, As we said at the time, you know, this was operating in a state where there was no such law, so there wasn't the same level of guidance involving 
never, ever, ever. Yeah. And we mentioned that he wrestled with it and felt like it was his service, like it was his duty to report it. It's very, you know, um, there are two points of view on it, and I, I know not everyone agrees on it, so it's an interesting one. And I, I'm fascinated at the thought of having a bunch of clergy discuss, no, no, not even, yeah. because... This could be considered divine intervention that put me at that scene. I had never thought about anything yeah. from that perspective, so that's really interesting. Rachel, thank you. This was eye-opening. Yeah, there um, there have also been states that have been discussing um, various laws to sort of carve out, like, mandated reporter-type roles. So if you, uh, if someone confesses something uh, that suggests there's going to be, like, harm done to a minor... Um, and and various states looking to pass laws involving that, uh, which I saw articles about literally the day before that episode of the podcast came out, you know, weeks after we had actually recorded it, um, and similarly incredibly heated opinions um, <laughs> on the subject from the people involved. Yeah, yeah. It's a, you know, it's one of those things that I think will always... I don't want to invoke Star Wars, but it has such a good moment where uh, in <laughs> Attack of the Clones, when Anakin and Padme are discussing how legislation works, and he's like, uh, really smart, really smart people should make the decisions about how laws work. And she's like, that's that's how it works. But not everybody agrees. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, so simple. This explains so many problems that we all uh, deal with all the time. Yeah. But just very simply in a Star Wars movie. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm interested to see how that debate goes on. Uh, in the meantime, if you would like to email us, you can do so at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us on social media as Missed in History. And if you would like to subscribe, you can do that on the iHeartRadio app or anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 